Did you uh, hear the news last week about Travis Kaufman? Travis from Fort Collins, Colorado. Avid runner. Very fit. Good looking guy. Travis was uh, running about seven miles. Isolated area in Fort Collins. Uh, isolated and alone. And he heard something behind him. And he normally wouldn't turn and look, but he felt like he should. And he turned and looked, and you know, 10 foot away from him was a mountain lion. And Travis was no ordinary, good thing he was in shape, but he tried to scare the beast away, but it was a juvenile mountain lion, not to be deterred from his afternoon lunch. And it lunged for him, grabbed him around his wrist, clawed his face. He needed 13 stitches. Travis said the first thing that kicked in was his fear reflex. When you fear, you freeze. And beast of prey uh, want that. Makes their job easier. <laughs> but he said he knew if he was going to survive, he couldn't freeze. He, his fear, fear reflex subsided and he, his fight reflex kicked in. I thought it was pretty amazing. He was able to get into a wrestling match with a mountain lion. Not your pleasant after Sunday afternoon deal, but he was successful. He said he tried to pick up a rock and knock it in the head, but he couldn't get the advantage because the beast had his, his arm locked in his jaws. Picked up a stick and tried to stick it with the stick. The stick was rotten and it broke. He said, if I'm going to do this, I have to do it with my hands. Travis, through his physical fitness, he's so blessed that he was physically fit he won the wrestling match Peta is not happy <laughs> but nonetheless uh, he was able to put his knee on the beast's throat choked it and suffocated it he felt bad about it he really felt he felt bad of course the uh, animal rights folks bless their hearts they said uh, this was a tragic thing for both man and beast it probably was they wanted one to say, well, the mountain lion just called that his home. And we know, I don't think mountain lions call anything, anything. They're just looking out for dinner. Bless Travis, he's getting better. Reminded me of David in the, in the Bible. You know, when he was facing Goliath, and he tried on Saul's magnificent armor, the Lord brought me face to face with the bear, and I killed the bear. The Lord brought me face to face with a lion, and I killed the lion. By the way, the lions in the Old Testament era were bigger, stronger, and meaner, and hungrier than uh, those mountain lions in the United States. They're probably double the size. David was victorious over a bear and a lion, but there's someone else, and Samson. Samson, um, and I don't know what you visualize when you see him in your mind, but I'm going to challenge that uh, with you in a moment. But Samson is on his way back to claim his bride. Lo and behold, he faces a lion on the way. He was able to be victorious in a wrestling match over the lion, broke its jaw in half, uh, was victorious. It says the Spirit of God came upon him. And he was able to be victorious. We've all heard about the exploits of Samson and his line. Another thing he did was he was able to take the jawbone of an ass and kill over a thousand of his opponents that were after him. That doesn't mean he did it all in one day, all at one setting, all at one time. But he was able to use just this weapon. Hey, this feels pretty good to me and I'll just use this. And he was able to be victorious over numbers of his opponents. Because, it says in the Bible, the Spirit of God came upon him. And there was other exploit when he wanted to get even with the Philistines. I knew I was saying that wrong. But the Philistines uh, were oppressing Israel for 40 years. Because Israel had fallen into backsliding against God again. Because the... The idols of Baal were so appealing to them. Here was a God they could control. They backslid. You know, they, want, they didn't want the commandments of God. But you know, the Bible says God's commandments are not grievous to be born. 
my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You know who has the hard life? Is someone who's apart from God. They have the difficult life. Those who walk in God have the ease of life. But, but Sam, Samson's exploits are great in the Bible. He's mentioned in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And when I see his name mentioned there, I say, I wonder why God put him in Hebrews chapter. He was not a sterling personality. What do you think about when you see Samson? By the way, Samson's name means one who is bright as the sun. Samson, shining. Shining personality. And he had one, believe me. Quite the ladies' man. In the first couple of chapters, he had fallen in love with three different women. No, well, he may have fallen into lust with three different women. I think he did love Delilah. By the way, let's just change gears and go back to the day before, the days before Samson was born to Manoah and his wife. Here was another miraculous birth. Manoah's wife could not give birth. And she's out in the field one day. Do you like angel stories? They're different than anything that the world has considered. They're not like a Hallmark card, trust me. They're not snowflakes all around with big wings and flowing gowns. They're not pretty ladies or chubby babies. Manoah's wife is out into the, and this is before Samson was born. She's out in the field and she encounters this person. And this person has a striking appearance. She said he had a very, uh, first of all, terrifying uh, appearance, but it looked like a person to her. This person talked to her in the field and said that you are going to give birth to a son who would judge Israel. And she did. She gave birth to Samson. He judged Israel for 20 years. And so when you read the story of Samson in the book of Judges, the dark ages of the Old Testament, the wild west of the Old Testament. I'm getting to appreciate it more. I think we'll end with this one. She's, the angel says to her, you're gonna give birth, he will judge. You have a son, he will judge Israel for 20 years. What does she do? She runs home and gets her husband, Manoah, and they come back out to the field and he has the same encounter. He has an angelic encounter that looks like a person with a striking appearance. By the way, Manoah asked this angel uh, that he had seen. You know, the Bible says that we can encounter angels unawares. But Manoah asked the angel his name. What is your name? So that you're giving me these great promises. And the angel looks at him and says, Manoah, why do you ask my name? My name is too magnificent for you to understand. Wow, <laughs> my name is too magnificent for you to understand. You can read this in, the, in Judges uh, 13 to 18. And so there, Manoah says to the angel, this is digress, this is somewhat ancillary to a story, but Manoah says to the angel, let me give you some food. Let me give you a cup of coffee and a piece of bread. <laughs> No, that was a covenantal thing. Somebody came to your tent, you fed them. You spared no expense to take care of them. And the angel says, if you, I cannot eat your food, but you can make an offering to Jehovah, your God. And so they brought the, the lamb, they put the lamb out as an offering to the Lord. And this is so spooky. This is one of the most surreal verses in the whole scripture, as far as I'm concerned. And so here the angel is, and I believe this has literally happened, by the way. They're there, and the smoke of the offering, and the flames are going up into the air. You've seen that, how the smoke kind of, the flames kind of burn the smoke as it goes up. And the smoke is swirling off the offering that... It, Manoah is giving to the angel because they promised them a child who would judge Israel for 20 years. What a great promise to a, uh, to a childless couple. Not only are you going to have a child, you're going to have a famous child. And so it says at the end of this chapter of 13, Manoah and his wife, as they watched the flames burn the smoke, the angel 
ascended in the flames. That's, can you see that? Steven Spielberg has got nothing on the Bible. Did you know that was there? Check me out on that. There's meaning there. It, it shook Manoah so much he said, I'm going to die. I've seen God. And his wife says, wife says to him, basically in New York language that time would understand, oh, would you get real? If God was going to kill you, he would have done it then. And so they gave birth to Samson. Promising child. Samson, the name who means bright is the sun. So full of promise. So full of disappointment. Samson was a man of his day. It says in the dark ages in the wild west of of Judges, the key verses in chapter 16, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Boy, did Samson do that. Whatever struck his fancy, he did. Whatever came down the path, he jumped on. And he did exactly what he wanted to do. But what do you think and what do you see about this man who was able to rip a lion's jaws apart and kill it? And who could pick up the gates of a whole city and walk miles with it. And he went through this career and he wanted to get even with the Philistines. So he got, he trapped. And this must have taken some time. But he was so intense on revenge because they had taken and killed his previous wife, his first wife, that he never got to know. Got to know. Uh, he was infatuated with her. They killed her. And so he got 300 foxes, it says in the Bible. And he put them into 150 pairs and put torches on their tails and lit the torches and sent them into the fields of the Philistines. Not much crop left that day. <laughs> they were... They tried everything they could to get even with him. This person, Samson, right as his son, how do you see him? Some people see him like Superman. His muscles are rippling, you know, and his shirt is tight, and he's got this chest, and he's got the six-pack, and his legs are like, like, like uh, pillars, and he's got these huge hands and this majestic face, and he can just grab a lion and rip its head apart. Look at this man, manly man. The Incredible Hulk, <laughs> Lou Ferrigno. Some people see Samson as Lou Ferrigno, the, the Incredible Hulk. You, how many of you remember Lou Ferrigno, the, the Incredible Hulk? Why did we watch that? <laughs> I, I don't know. I just like the moment when he turned in from the sweet, nice little guy, the businessman, into the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> but some people see Samson like Superman or the Incredible Hulk or Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, here is... If you understand the scripture, you know that, that none of that is true about Samson. He looked like an average guy. I mean, he might have been big, but when you looked at him, you wouldn't think for a minute that he could do supernatural things with the supernatural spirit gift and strength. Samson was gifted by God with supernatural strength. And so when you see this average looking person, not the Incredible Hulk, you see this average looking person picking up the gates of a city and walking off with it. And you see him with just the jawbone of a donkey killing a thousand people. And you see him ripping a lion's head apart. You say, wow, how did that average looking guy do that? It wouldn't be so surprising if you looked like Lou Ferrigno, right? It wouldn't at least even seem miraculous. But if you saw me, John Ray, rip a, rip a, I can't even rip a grasshopper's head off. (laughs) (laughs) But if you saw me doing something miraculous, then you'd say, you know, God is in that. I know John Wright, he can't do that. (laughs) And so it was with Samson. I'm sure he was physically fit, maybe like Travis. But here's this average looking person. Surprising when the Spirit of God came upon him and he was able to do these miraculous feats, not in his own strength, but with the strength of the Lord. When Delilah was trying to, to get the secret of his strength, you know, he was a Nazarite. 
No, you could be a Nazarite for 30 days or 60 days or a couple of months. You could take a bowel of a Nazarite. You wouldn't cut your hair. You wouldn't drink anything. You would not eat certain foods. You would not touch a dead body. There was all these rules and regulations about being pure as a Nazarite. Samson was dedicated as a Nazarite for his entire life. And the only, one and only vow of the Nazarite that he did not break. He touched dead bodies, he drank, he did all these lustful things. The only one thing that he did not break was he did not cut his hair. You know, some, somehow deep in his heart, he had, he had to have one vestige of his vow. Samson shining as his son. In the Old Testament, and I'll give you these some time to write down. I didn't give you a slide on this, but in the Old Testament days, the Holy Spirit came upon people. For certain people, certain places, certain persons, and certain times. That's the Holy Spirit's activity in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on my sons and daughters, and I will put my word on their tongue and in their hearts. Today, we're living in a day that's not certain people, certain places, certain purposes. All God's people, you and I, if you're a Christian, are filled with the spirit. If we only knew. Samson was gifted with this gift. The Holy Spirit didn't live inside of him. We know that. You can't visit a prostitute like he did and have the Holy Spirit in you. He saw something. He just went after it. But the Holy Spirit came upon him. Here's a, here's a uh, you know, when I read this, I question, how could God use a prolific person like that? How could God use somebody who was a sinner like that? Well, he had this one covenant thing, his hair. It gives me hope. God used Samson to save not a bunch of vulnerable men, women, and children who who were under the Philistines' rule for 20 years, 40 years. God used Samson in his divine purposes, a man that was touched by the Holy Spirit, to preserve the history, the heritage, and the line of the people of God through whom Jesus would come. And through which we have this. So Samson played a part in preserving the people of God. If he didn't, we wouldn't even have this today. But God chooses whom he will. And you say to God, why did you have to choose him? But he did. And Samson was, he knew he had the gift of supernatural strength. He would walk into the Philistines area and when he knew they were setting ambushes for him, he didn't care. Uh, he was careless, really. He was presuming upon the gift of God in his life. You know, there are Christians today who are very gifted people. And guess what? They know it. And if you don't believe them, ask them, they'll tell you. Somebody was telling me about a pastor. They knew that he didn't walk into the sanctuary. He kind of floated in. I'm, re- I'm just lucky if I can make it down the aisle without tripping. <laughs> but there are people in the New Covenant times who are gifted by God. They know it. They presume upon it. If you have a gift of teaching, preaching, singing, ministering, cooking, whatever it is, Thank God for that gift. It can be here today and not here tomorrow because it's the gift of God. Never presume upon the gifts of God. He chooses whom he wants to use when he wants to use them. Samson pushed it to the utter limit with God. Samson embodied his time. He had seven. Well, let me read these to you. I wrote them down. Samson, somebody said there's a Samson syndrome. Don't get afflicted with the Samson syndrome. I'll tell you what it is. The Samson syndrome, for any of God's people, is number one, arrogance. 
Number two is indulgent. And number three is ignorance. Arrogance, indulgence, ignorance. Beloved, God wants us to be holy people. I know you may know some holy people and you say, I don't want to be like that guy. No, holiness just means wholeness, wholesomeness. It's not weirdness. <laughs> but the Samson syndrome was arrogance, indulgence, and ignorance. Why do you say he was ignorant? Someone said that Samson was like the high school jock. He could do anything, but he didn't have an A on his report card, never had. I think, I think he was very intelligent. But he was ignorant of one important thing, one of the saddest verses in all of the scriptures in, in chapter 16 of Samuel, I mean in uh, Judges. He said he did not realize he did not realize that the Spirit of God had departed from him. Isn't that sad? What kind of a relationship would you have with God if you didn't know that he was absent? Now, if I get estranged with, estranged with somebody, I can feel it, can't you? And I don't want to talk about personal things, but in your family life, I know very personally, when you get estranged from your mate, you can feel that distance, that coolness. Samson indulged his, he loved women. And Delilah was, and as the Spanish say, he, la vida loco. You know the song, right? He lived the crazy life. And so Samson, I don't want to have the Samson syndrome, do you? If you compare Gideon, that we talked about last week, and Samson, let me draw a little conclusion. Uh, a little. Gideon started with a pile of rubble and ended with an orderly life. And God, and his, as the king, he wouldn't be the king. They said, be my king. Gideon said, no, you got a king, it's God. But he started with rubble and ended with the kingship of God in his life and family. Samson started out with the kingship of God and gifted in his life and he ended up in a pile of rubble. And you know the, what I'm talking about. That's the Samson syndrome. He wasn't shining like the sun. Let me give you a couple of other things. And I'll write these down for you, maybe for the next week. I'll just remind you of them. Well, Mike is preaching next week, maybe the week after. Samson was impulsive, isolated, insolent, insolent, and, and insulated. When you see Samson in the book of Judges, he never is with anybody unless it's a female that he's got his head laying on her lap, getting a haircut. He didn't seem to have a buddy. His dad said one time, uh, he said to his dad, give me that woman, I want her. And his dad said, Samson, there's plenty of good looking women right here in town. No, I want that one. He wanted his way. He wouldn't listen to advice even from his own dad. And so he was impulsive, isolated, insolent, and he would not listen. But he was still gifted by God. And you know why God let the gift of, gift of strength lay on him? To preserve the word and, to, and the heritage and the destiny of God's people. God used Samson for that. So I have hope with all my faults and problems and issues in my life. I don't want to be like Samson. The Bible paints a picture of a man self-possessed, presuming, ignorant, and indulgent, and didn't know when God had left his life. One who had the shining of the sun. He fell in love with Delilah. You know what her name means? Delicate. 
the delicate one. You know, you women hate to see this in another woman. They're using their weakness to get the man. Oh, can you help poor little me? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Delilah, standing next to Samson, the mighty warrior who could kill any number of Philistines, and she's just holding on to his arm like his little, little puppy. And he fell hook, line, and sinker for that. He didn't care that God had gone out of his life, but he really wanted to preserve that relationship with Delilah. He made the wrong choice. What gives a river its strength? A mighty, the mighty Mississippi or the Amazon, what makes the river so strong? The banks. The banks channel the strength of the river. Samson was a river without banks. He just meandered all over the place. And you know the story about how poor little delicate Delilah, if you really love me, if you really love me, you wouldn't make fun of me. You would tell me your secret of your strength. And you know, some people think that Delilah and Samson knew that it wasn't his hair. What was on his head was just hair. What was significant about his hair that she put into seven big dreadlocks? What was significant about his hair, that was the last vestige of his covenant with the Nazarite vow of, to God. The last thing he didn't give up. And for this little delicate Delilah, he surrendered his last vestige of his covenant with God. Wow. I hope she was something <laughs> because she, he gave up God Almighty for her. The Chinese have a saying, mighty heroes cannot defeat a beautiful woman. A river without banks, ignorant, arrogant, indulgent. And yet, God used him. And so they come in, they give him a haircut, they cut off his dreadlocks because he's so infatuated with Delilah that he gives up his relationship with God. And he didn't, he didn't even know it. And so the third time she betrayed him for 1,100 pieces of silver, by the way, the third time she deceived him, she got up and she's, he's laying on her lap. She's caressing his back, caressing his hair. He's just snoring. He's just loving the attention. She jumps up and says, Sam, uh, Sam, Samson, the Philistines and the sword of the self Philistines is on you. He says, ah, oh, don't worry about it. I'll just get up and shake them off like I did the lion, that I did the thousand, that I took the city gates. I'll just shrug them off like I've always had. He got up. He was weak and, and strengthless. Not because he had a haircut, but because he gave up his Nazarite last vestige of commitment to God. He did not know the Spirit left him. They captured him. They bound him. They blinded him. They took his eyes out. They gouged his eyes out. How sad. A disaster was Samson. He went from being the mighty warrior of God to a clown that was entertaining the Philistines, his enemies. He was the nightclub act. He was a Barnum and Bailey circus clown, the Bible says. And so there have a, you know the story. They have the big celebration and they're celebrating the victory of Dagon, their great God, the God of wheat. Some think it's a god of fish, but I believe it's a god of wheat and the harvest. Some despicable practices under the worship of Dagon. But they're having this great celebration. Thousands, all the city officials, all the princes of the realm, they're all there. Bring out Samson, let him entertain us. Our god Dagon has defeated our worst enemy. We want to see him dance. Did you see the movie? Uh, it's 1949, so I know some of you never saw it. <laughs> If you haven't, get it and look at it. Cecil B. DeMille, I think. Samson and Delilah. Victor Mature and Susan Hayworth. It was the saddest scene when they brought this blinded, 
clown that used to be invested with the power of God and he dances for the enemies. Beloved, I'm not dancing for the devil. Are you? So, the story goes, and we know that Samson told one of the servants, just let me rest, let me lean against the pillar. Something was happening in his heart. One day he reached up and felt his hair. My hair's coming back. I believe his faith came back. I remember the Nazarite vow. My hair is growing again. Oh God. He had a timely repentance. And so he leans against the temple and he prays to God. Oh sovereign Lord. Let me have strength one more time. Guess what? God answered the prayer. He pushed the columns apart. Some of the greatest artwork in all the Christian uh, literature is that scene. 3,000 people were killed at the crumble. But how sad for Solomon, uh, Samson. Started with strength and ended under a pile of rubble. And the last day we hear about Samson is his family came and picked him up from under the rubble and took him reverently and put him in his father's grave, Manoah, the one who had seen the angel rise. Samson was finally at peace. This is the word of God. Take it, believe it, and live.